All right, welcome. So today we're going to talk about economic indicators, which is the start of this unit that's all based around the question, how do we measure and understand the entire economy? These indicators are what are going to help us measure the economy. So it's pretty hard to know what's going on, how to understand it, if you don't have a way to measure it. Just like you don't know if you're doing well in understanding the concepts in a class if you don't get a grade or not. Uh, you'll be taking notes on that chart that I gave you as we go through this. Uh, on this chart, you won't necessarily fill in every single box, so don't worry about that if it seems like some boxes don't have anything that needs to go in them because they might not. Okay, so the first thing we're going to have to tell you is what an index is. This is up there at the top. An index, this is not one of our indicators themselves, an index is a word that's going to pop up a bunch of times, so it's just one number calculated from a bunch of other numbers. You guys are really familiar with one type of index called your GPA, your grade point average. Your GPA condenses all your grades over uh, you know, two semesters per grade, eight semesters total in high school. Um, so you don't need to tell someone your, your grade in science, in social studies, in math, and all of your different grades. You can just say, oh, my GPA is a 3.5. So at the end of your senior year, after having uh, eight semesters, worth of eight classes each semester perhaps. You might have as many as 64 different grades there. You can just give them one number, so it's a lot simpler. Inflation is something we've been talking about throughout this course, really. <clears throat> There's two ways to define inflation. One, you call it the decrease in the value of money. So you know that when you talk to your parents, they'll say a hamburger cost 50 cents when we were kids and a gallon of gas only cost 80 cents or whatever. Um, so this is the second definition, increase in average prices of good over, goods over time, and then a decrease in the value of money is just the flip side to that. The idea that <clears throat> 20 bucks in 1960 was worth a lot of money, now it's not nearly as much. Inflation is not a bad thing. So I think students often get confused and think that inflation is going to be a bad thing, but it's not necessarily. One to three percent is good for the reason that if inflation is happening, if you know that your dollars are not going to be worth as much uh, a year from now, or 10 years from now, or 20 years from now, it gives you an incentive to spend them. Whereas if your dollars became more and more valuable over time, if you could just hoard everything in the bank and never spend a dime, then you know your retirement would be fantastic. So, so it would, people would really stop spending money and it would be bad for the economy overall. This is measured with there's a bunch of ways to measure it, but the main way we're going to talk about is the thing that's in the next row, the CPI. You'll generally see inflation as a percent change per year, so 1 to 3 percent per year, meaning that prices are 1 percent more in 2014 than 2013, etc. Alright, so the consumer price index, this is how we measure inflation, at least in the US. Um, there's actually a bunch of different consumer price indices the main one, this is the main one, the CPI, uh, urban consumers. There's other ones that work for businesses in particular or, you know, whatever sector. Um, you'll notice that the source for this data is the BLS. This is the Bureau, let's see if I can spell this word, of Labor and Statistics, or maybe just Statistics. I don't think the end is there. Um, they just keep track of the economy. I spelled that way wrong. Well, no, maybe not. Um, but anyway, they keep track of the economy. Uh, they're a, a U.S. government branch. <clears throat> so they measure, uh, the consumer price index measures inflation through the changing price of a sample basket of goods. Students often get hung up on this thing about what the heck this basket is. But just imagine you physically have a basket, um, and the things that go in that basket are things that the average consumer might buy. And uh, the, the BLS actually uh, has polls on what Americans buy. So, like, I think this is yeah, the most recent reweighting re was in December 2012. So every few years, they'll send out polls and ask a bunch of Americans what they buy. Um, and then they'll base, they'll base what goes into these components. So here, food and beverage, 15.261%. Housing, 3.4%. Wait, no, 41%. That doesn't seem right. Um, so this is what the average consumer might spend. You individually might not spend the same amount on these things, but it helps to give you a yardstick. 
Um, and like I said, there's different baskets for different groups of people that are more accurate for them. Um, the consumer and price index is really important because it allows us to compare prices. Um, we can measure inflation over time with this. Otherwise, you might say, oh yeah, I know inflation has been happening because bread costs more than it did two years ago and gasoline costs more than it did two years ago and so does all these other things I can think of, but you wouldn't know exactly how much. Um, just fun fact for you. So the CPI is actually in a, it's a number based on 100. So uh, the BLS decided that in 1982 through 83, <laughs> uh, they were going to pin the CPI at 100. So how much stuff cost in 1982 through, oh, four, 1982 through four, uh, that was 100. So as prices increase, the CPI is a number that's above 100. So in 2013, it was 235, I looked this up. So things cost 2.3 times, three to five times as much as they did in 1982 on average. However, you'll usually see CPI changes, again, as percents in inflation. So that's what you'll actually usually see is the percent. You are almost never see the number out of 100. Okay, next one, gross domestic product. This is actually the basic um, indicator that you'll hear. You've probably heard of it before, um, referred to as GDP. It's just everything produced in a country in a given year. It really, what it measures is the size of the economy. Like if you could put an economy on a scale, you know, like your bathroom scale, that's what GDP would be. So it's really the most, the most basic measure. Um, so this is gonna be measured in dollar amounts. Uh, in the US, <clears throat> our most recent GDP, I didn't write this down, but I was just looking at it. I think it's about $14 trillion or so, something like that. Um, so it's going to be in dollars or any other currency. Uh, this formula is how one calculates it. So the C is consumption. Oops. Consumption. Which is household spending. So anything that uh, households, people spend on. Um, the I is investment. And what they mean by that is government spend, or excuse me, business spending. Anything that businesses spend money on, that's considered an investment in their business. The G is government spending. So everything that government would spend on, from roads and bridges to um, you know Medicare payments, what whatever. Uh, and then the X, this is the most confusing one, is net exports. And net exports means that it is exports minus imports. Here in the US, we import a lot more than we export. So this actually ends up being a negative number for us. <laughs> so it hurts our GDP. It makes it lower, the fact that we, we import tons and tons of products and we don't make as many. Um, FYI about gross domestic product, it does not include any non-market activities, meaning free activities, so like uh, housework, uh, you, people who, uh, who stay at home and take care of the house, that doesn't get included, or if you babysit for your friend in exchange for, I don't know, baking them bread or something, that doesn't get included. It only includes things where money exchanges hands and those things are known to the government. So any sort of under the table activities, like my babysitting example, that's probably gonna be under the table anyway. Uh, or if you were, you know, you work at and don't pay taxes on something, that's not gonna get included in the GDP. Uh, which is actually, I looked this up, about eight to 10% of the entire US economy is stuff that's under the table. <laughs> which could include everything from drug sales to like illegal drugs to teenagers babysitting. All right, the next one is GDP per capita. This is just GDP. Capita is a Latin word, I think, meaning person. Just GDP divided by the population of the country. And this is the entire population of the country. Uh, it kind of measures the average production or the average wealth of a country per person. So it gives you a better sense. You know, it's kind of hard to compare the GDP of the US with Canada because Canada has, I'm taking a total stab here, but something in the 
30 to 50 million population range, whereas the U.S. has 380 million or something. So it's really comparing apples and oranges. To You can get a sense that the U.S.'s economy is bigger as a whole than Canada's, but that doesn't mean that the average person in Canada is dirt poor because they have a much lower GDP. Uh, they don't. They You can see they're both bright green, meaning uh, the GDP per capita is you know 35 or so there. <clears throat> All right, nominal GDP. Nominal GDP is just GDP in the current market dollars. So if I if I oh this is my number. I told you today's GDP is about 15.7 trillion dollars in 2013. That's in 2013 dollars. And since we talked about how inflation happens, you can't compare 2013 dollars to dollars in 1950. They're just completely apples and oranges. So real GDP is GDP that's adjusted for inflation. So you'll have multiple years here. So this, this chart I found goes all the way from 2001 to 2012, and uh, it shows real versus nominal GDP. It doesn't say which, uh, oh, it's just in percent, so it doesn't matter what year the real GDP is in. But you'll convert everything to, say, $2014. Um, and you can do this with the CPI or another price index. You can see how much stuff cost in 2001 versus 2013. Um, if you try to compare multiple years with nominal GDP, I guess it, it'll tell you things both about inflation and about the changing GDP, but you don't know which is which. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's like changing two variables at once in science class. Um, the example I like to use is that it's like measuring with a rubber band. So if I were to put hash marks on this rubber band and then hold it up to something, I could say, oh, uh, well this is, you know, say one, each of these is a centimeter. This, this item I'm holding up is three centimeters long. But then if I stretch the rubber band, which is like inflation happening, then I can't use those same measurements again. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't make sense. So, so real GDP adjusted for inflation, nominal GDP, it ain't nothing but a number, just like age. So you can't compare year to year. Gross national product is another indicator you may have heard before. GNP. This is everything produced by residents of a country. So GDP is based on location, meaning that <clears throat> GDP is everything produced within a country, no matter who owns it. So if there is a German-owned factory in the US, that gets included in our GDP, but it's not included in GNP. Whereas <clears throat> an American-owned factory in Germany would get included in the US's GNP, not our GDP. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, GNP is not used as much anymore. The entire world abandoned it as their main measure of the economy well before 1991, which is when the U.S. abandoned it as the main measure, but you will still hear it sometimes. Unemployment. This is one that I'm sure you've heard before. Uh, this is just the portion of adults without jobs but are currently looking for jobs. And literally, the BLS again, these people keep coming up, they call people up and say, hey, are you looking for work? And you say, yes or no. <laughs> or like, have you applied for a job within the last month or something, I think, is the question. Um, and that's basically it. If you're an adult and you, are, you have applied for a job in the last month, you get included. Um, if you are underemployed, meaning you have a part-time job, but you'd really like to have a full-time job, or if simply you're unemployed but you stopped looking, um, you you know maybe you're unemployed for a whole year, which happened to a lot of people in the downturn around 2008, and by the end of that year you might not be applying for jobs every month anymore. Um, so those people get left out too. So there can be a little bit of uh, interference in those numbers. Uh, this is important to know how many people are out of work. Obviously, it kind of measures economic performance, but like I said, it can leave people out sometimes. And here's a couple um, indicators that try to try to add a little bit more than we might otherwise get. So the Human Development Index, or the HDI, measures how developed a society is, or what it's like to live in that society. So it includes a much broader picture than the GDP. 
Uh, it does include some stuff about money here, so living standards, which are uh, defined as national income per capita, so they they divide out all the money that all the people in the country make, uh, divided by per person. So that's part of it to measure the living standard. But also educational achievement, whether people are well educated or not, makes a difference in how what it's like to live in a place, and also health, life expectancy. Uh, so the, this is intended to give a broader picture than just you know a dollar value. Uh, it's measured in a number of zero to one, so one one being the highest it can go. Uh, and then actually what you'll normally see this as is, is rankings. So countries ranked number one in the HDI versus number, you know, 173 or whatever, how many countries there are. Um, and then lastly, the Gini coefficient, or something called the Gini index. This measures the distribution of income, or income inequality. This is important because if you do an average, just like if I were to average your grades on a test, I could have one class where uh, there's five kids who get 100% and everybody else gets a 50%, or I could have <clears throat> the entire class getting a 75% and end up with about the same average, maybe, I don't know, check the math. But, um, but this gives you a better sense of how close people are in income inequality. So a zero is perfect equality, meaning every single person in the country makes the same amount every year. One means that one person makes every dime in the whole country and nobody else makes anything. Um, and this is important because it has a really big impact on how what it's like to live in a country. And it's not, it doesn't come up in these averages, like I said. So here, this picture is from Brazil, I think. <clears throat> and I found similar things I studied abroad in South Africa when I was in college. So similar things, you'd have shacks on one place, and then you'd have like razor wire and private security guards around people's pools and, and hot tubs and racquetball courts and stuff, because it's so unequal. So it, it's a lot different to live in a society like that than it is in... I uh, number the number one ranked country was like Sweden or something like that, uh, where everybody is pretty equal, uh, and this can not only have an impact just on what it's like to live in a place, but also on the economic growth of that place. In fact, in the U.S., uh, one of the things that might be hurting our recovery is the fact that our income inequality has grown in the last 20 years or so, 20 or 30 years, and that means that a lot of people don't have enough money to spend money on stuff, and our the economy really depends on consumer spending, so this can give you another another picture of what it's like to be in an economy. So those are all the economic indicators for now. You can take another look at this if there's something you want to fill out on your chart, but again, you might not fill up all those boxes, so just put things wherever it makes sense to you.